So hi everyone and welcome to Summerford Associates podcast. Um, we have a series of podcasts exploring current technologies and current trends and technology um, pain points that our clients, so you, will be grappling with. Um, I've been interviewing some leaders in our partners today and today we're talking to Neil Stobart from um, Cloudian. Welcome, Neil. Hi, thank you. <laughs> uh, so our subject today is the future trends in data management. So data's not going anywhere, of course. It's not going away, and we're getting savvier about how we can use it to our advantage. Cloudian, as I understand it, offers intelligent data storage. Um, so we'll go into an example of Cloudian's use, um, uh, using a real example with uh, one of your clients, um, Neil. Yep. And then I think... By explaining what's going on now, we'll probably quite easily get into the future trends in data storage as well as what as Neil sees them. So it uh, should be quite an interesting conversation. Um, so Neil, why don't you just start with telling me a bit about yourself so people know where you've come from and your background. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Anne. Yeah, um, so uh, you know, I've been at Cloudian for coming to six years now. I'm the, um, the vice president of global... We call it system engineering, and essentially, it's all of the technical folks that are out there, um, you know, talking to our clients, whether that's um, selling or um, installing, you know, the the post sales consultancy. I've um, yeah had a had a checkered history, I suppose. I started off at um, the Woolwich Building Society back in the nineties, straight out of university. Um, you know, worked on their sort of rolling out, you know, their PC um, server estate at the time. They were moving from my, a mainframe. I was there for sort of a few years, went into the um, reseller world. So I was at Morse, big reseller um, in the data center. I was there for sort of three or four years. Um, you know, really got a lot of um, technical knowledge around so many different platforms, but that's really where I got a, a, an introduction to data storage. I was really around about the time the fiber channel was coming to market. Um, so, you know, working on, on that side, um, you know, after Morse, I kind of moved um, to work with a, um, a startup from California. It was focused around sort of fiber channel storage networks. Then, you know, that wasn't quite so successful, that one. It was a little bit uh, ahead of its time. I think technology-wise, moved up to um, sort of a couple of years at Apache Data Systems, which were very, um, you know, very, very good times, actually. Very strong technology. Probably, um, you know, the most reliable storage technology in the world. Um, you know, so you, you learn a lot of good things from that side. Yeah. And then from there, uh, I went into another storage startup, a company called Compellent, which was um, fantastic, actually, probably um, some of my favorite years, you know, really great people to work with, some really smart people. They were based out of Minneapolis, which is a, actually a beautiful part of the world when it's not snowing. <laughs> um, and then we got acquired by Dell from, from Compellent. So I spent a few years at Dell, which was, um, you know, completely different. Um, yeah. From the start of culture, it must've been a, <laughs> bit of a culture shock. Well, they, they always claimed that they were the biggest startup, uh, in the world to, to Dell, which, um, I find it a little bit amazing, uh, to think of that. It's like that, but there were 120,000 people, I think, when, when I joined. Wow. So yeah, that was going from 500 people to 120,000. Um, and then from Dell, that's when I, I, I came to Cloudian. And I'd always been focused, really, that the storage um, trends had been what we would call block and file storage. And that's what a lot of people would be familiar with. Uh, Cloudian, um, you know, merges on the object storage technology, which is something that's very different technology-wise and really um, is designed to target very different use cases. And a lot of these use cases are stuff that's just, you know, coming around now. It probably wasn't around sort of 10 years ago. Object storage has been around for 12, 15 years. And actually, I worked with it when I was at um, Hitachi mm -hmm. um, in the very early days. It was probably only a couple of vendors uh, producing that kind of solution. So now it's, you know, there's, there's probably you know, 10, 15 solutions on the market. Um, and really, it's targeting, you know, because people just have more and more data to deal with. It's, it becomes a very difficult task because the other storage systems don't scale, can't hold as much data as as customers actually have. And I mean, it's, you know, many, many customers have, you know, I mean, I was talking to one customer and I think they had over 100 storage systems, you know. Wow. Um, so you've really seen the trends from from early 90s of data storage throughout to now when now, yeah. just everywhere. And, and where we're going because it's it's i think we're just we're on the cusp of data i mean people complain about data growing all the time but i think the exponential growth is just around the corner 
Because really? We haven't got there yet? I don't think we've got there yet. No, it's it's I think the, the big driver for data growth right now is what machines generate. And and of course, you know, for, certainly in the area that, that you work in with um Splunk. You know, with Splunk, you know, you know, you just want to, any any information that you can gather and can help your business, whether it's you know improve services, new services or reduce cost or you know, better SLAs, you know, you, you may as well use that data if you've got it, use yeah. it. And that's, that's the challenge that um, everybody stores a lot of data and they're really just keeping it just in just in case. You never know when we might <laughs> need this. Um, and that, I think the the mindset now is if we have all this data, let's let's use it. Right? We're, we're, you know, storage isn't cheap. And especially at the... Um, you know the, the the real scalable level. You know when the in the multi petabytes, it's certainly not cheap. And no. let's get a return on investment. Let's yeah. let's get let's use this information. Let's that we use the data around. and turn it into business value. Um, you, you know to like I say, either reduce cost or improve or add new services. I think yeah. they're the really they're the main trains. People should be looking. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, it's um, it's been a a, a, a wild ride <laughs> <laughs> in technology, but. Uh, for our listeners, we um, Neil and I had a, con- a conversation just to prepare for this conversation in a way, and it really struck me that there's there's a lot of cycles that you've probably seen and trends in in the in the data storage. So I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing your take on it. Um, yeah. For a bit of context, um, Summerford works with Cloudian as a partner, so you have you, you're the you're the vendor, you have the the product, and we yeah. can resell it, and we also have the PS to kind of install it. I, th- I think, and especially from um, you know from your perspective and your your customers' perspectives, you know we, we see storage is it, it is a necessary evil, or it always has been a necessary evil. You know, you your applications, you know, generate on your and your people generate data um, that's very important, and you need you need to keep it and you need to protect it, and it is, you know, where's where's the value out of that? You know, we're, we're just storing stuff. It's, in, in a way, like a library. And the value is if you ever want that data to go and find it. But um, if you look at the IT spend in in the data center, certainly on the infrastructure side, you know, if you look at, you know, break it down, typically we break it down into three areas, compute, networking, and storage. Mm-hmm. There's more money spent in storage in the data center than the other two. And especially when you start to factor in, you know, your power and cooling for uh, mm-hmm. your equipment. I mean, storage generates a lot of heat because you have a lot of disk drives spinning Constantly, so you know, I add in the, the heating and the um, the power, uh, and of course, you know, rack density because you know, again, storage takes up a lot of space. You know, we are, we are the biggest cost. So any, anything that we can do to help um, a customer reduce the cost, and especially, you know, where we're focusing at the multi petabyte level, where potentially, you know, you've got thousands and thousands of disk drives. Anything we can do to be more efficient. Um, you know, provide better protection, provide better availability to that data. That that's kind of our USP, um, yeah. I guess. I mean, t- typically, you know, if you've got a traditional um, storage system like a block or a file box, you know, it's we call it a scale-up model. You know, you have a couple of storage controllers with lots of disk drives underneath that. You can only attach so many disk drives to those those controllers. What we do is we use traditional um, standard servers, and we may, may basically make a big storage cluster, mm-hmm. and we can cluster up to about four thousand servers into a single cluster, into a single namespace. Oh, right. And those those nodes, I mean, that our biggest, we are software defined, so you can deploy just as that software on your own servers, mm-hmm. or you know you can. But we we also sell appliances. A lot of customers like that single throat to choke from a support mm-hmm. perspective, especially with enterprise storage where it's important not to lose data. Our biggest box, I think, is about a petabyte. It's just a server with lots of disk drives in, and it's about a petabyte. So, you know, you can have 4,000 one petabyte nodes, and then you, you know, the numbers are, that's actually four exabytes of um, storage in one, one cluster, which, uh, and it's funny because we start to throw around terms like exabytes as if it's just, you know, really easy to do, and, and it really isn't. I mean, if anyone's ever tried to do a data migration yeah. job, I think to move an exabyte of data, I calculated it would take something like three, uh, one and a half years wow. to move an exabyte of data over a 10 gig network. 
So I mean, very simple math, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's scary. Really, so you can get Cloudian to deal with all of those exabytes. If you... Exactly. Well, but there's, I... there's not many customers that are that are quite. At <laughs> but, no, but there that's are, quite right. But there are some coming. I mean, we had some conversations with a Japanese car manufacturer. And of course, all the car manufacturers are now building in telemetry yeah. to all of the cars so they can offer a better service, fault finding, you know, predictive analysis on failures. They they reckon they would use an exabyte of data in the first year with all their cars, yeah. um, you know, with telemetry. But we're all getting intelligent objects. So the machine data is quite a, a lot of information already in normal companies. But yeah. as you start to get more and more of everything's intelligent, you can send so much data in i can see that exponential growth when you put it that way but i thought also you had um intelligent storage so the metadata on top of it and stuff like yeah. that and that and this and this is um very unique to object storage so you know i was explaining to you the other, the other day and what i always kind of compare it is that with, with traditional storage platforms you do have an element of metadata about your data so metadata is basically data about data it's data that's describing your um, data objects. So if you take, um, you know, a JPEG image, for example, a photograph that you've taken, if you were storing that in a file system in your regular storage, you'd have some system metadata that would describe that data from a, it, it would tell you how big that file was, who, you know, created and who owned that file, uh, what the file name is, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but if you've got a lot of JPEG images in a, in a folder, let's say you've got a, a thousand and, and, you know, some of our customers have, you know, millions and billions of, of um, photos, you know, typically they're kind of going to be, you know, it's going to be 1.jpg, 2.jpg, 3.jpg. So from that that description and the system metadata, okay, we can see when it was created, but I might have taken, you know, 100 pictures that day. So there's no way, unless you actually open up that image to see, you know, what that, what that data is in effect. So with the metadata, what we can do is we can add uh, what we call user-definable um, metadata. So let's say that I'd taken a picture of, um, um, you know, my, my two dogs and cat in my garden. Um, I could actually tag, you know, I could put the names of the dogs, you know, Peppo and Bello and the cat. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to – stupid names, but not as bad as some previous pets that we've had. Um, <laughs> you know, and I put garden and I might even put in, um, you know, what day I took a photograph. Mm -hmm. I've then got the ability to then go and search on the fact that I've tagged this data with, you know, and I want to see all my photographs with my dog, Paul Pepper. And, you know, I could do that search and they would bring everything back rather than have to go and open up every every yeah. thousand pictures. And where that gets really interesting and where we want to take this and where the kind of, you know, technology is developing is use things like image recognition. Mm. to automatically tag that data as it's brought in. So, of course, at the moment, I've got to go and manually add that tag in, yep. uh, those tags into that, um, you know, to, the, to, to add to that data photograph. You know, the way that a lot of um, business applications work at the moment is that you have a database and, you know, you have, you know, your user and they're typing in, you know, try to the database when they're, when they're having a conversation with a client or whenever they're, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I did a project for the bank way back in the day where every letter that was brought into the bank was scanned and there mm -hmm. was no paper, you know, everything was digital. Yeah. And then there was somebody adding in metadata saying, you know, this letter was from, you know. <laughs> no bank. OCR and automatic there. Not, not, not then. Not at that time. Not, not okay. at that time. No, yes. Um, so Cloudian so at the moment. Like that, and, we, and we can add that in. And then yeah. so with the, with, sorry, with the image recognition, what you can do is – you upload an image, the image recognition will run. Obviously, it's got to query a database to look at other images to do that image match. We did a proof of concept using you know, Google recognition. And then so basically, it was able to automatically add the tags to the metadata. So it was, you know, it was picking up. Just so using their APIs? Or... Using their APIs, yeah. Very, very simple. Um, quite a lot of stock images. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we can we can also get, um, you know, facial recognition. Um, mm -hmm. You know, from internal, when I say facial recognition, not sort of identifying a person, but identifying, you know, moods. Is somebody smiling? Is somebody frowning and happy? 
Again, you know, there's the example of having a port a camera um, on on a shop doorway and seeing what the mood of uh, of a customer is when they leave. You know, did they, you know, so if they have the things at the airport marketers. now with the buttons, where you know, happy, yeah. sad, um, indifferent. So, Cloudian's sort of looking at making their data even more, or allowing customers to use Cloudian to to make their data even richer and more automatically tagged. Is that right? Yeah, you're making it um, so that you can find it. Yeah, and you can use it. Um, that, I think that's the, the really important piece. Everyone stores data, but they don't necessarily use it. Yeah, and I think again, where you know the the, the business that you're in, it's you know, very much around, you've got all of this data being generated. Let's turn that into something useful. Yeah. And, you know, we can do that not just in the, um, let's say, in the Splunk use case, because obviously we, in essence, we provide, I think, for the Splunk environment, we're trying to help with the economics of that. that mm-hmm. um, Splunk can get very expensive in terms of the, the storage resources it needs because of the you know, the architecture of the, the software, the, the scale out, um, you know, and they, they brought out the, you know, the S3 connector recently. And, and I think we can help with that from a, from a cost and a data protection point of view. But, you know, in, in that use case, we're not actually using, in, in the, using the intelligence of our platform. We're essentially, uh, a, you know, a dumb, big, you know, cost-effective storage platform. There's, mm. that, that's where we're getting used in, in the Splunk environment. It'd be the same if we were using us for backup. We're a very good storage platform for backup because we, you know, work very well in terms of throughput capability, both, you know, doing your backups and recovering um, scale and, and we can, you know, make multiple copies across different um, data centers. So really nice in that, that use case. But again, you're not needing to use, um, you know, some of the, the key, you know, the backup software has its own database. That's where the intelligence is in, in that yeah. use case. It's when we talk to people about using us as a using object storage as primary storage. And that's where we've always been thought of as archive or secondary storage. But if you're going to put unstructured data into us, we have a customer that's um, got a satellite up in the sky, but bizarrely. Okay. Um, I guess why, why I said that. But they're basically photographing um, the entire UK and they're basically doing, I think, a metre squares wow. and then, um, you know, quite, quite detailed. And then I think they're, they're sending, I don't know how they do it and, and I'm not a geologist, but, you know, they're going underground. So they're almost like getting a subsection of, you know, um, what's underneath the ground mm-hmm. um, to try and detect, you know, I guess whether there's oil or gas or what. Yeah. You know, uh, what is the rock? And so you could go to that company and say, I'm thinking about building on this land, you know, what and you might I see underneath. But they are mapping the entire UK and I think they have something around about 10 petabytes of storage. Mm-hmm. So every photo that gets beamed down from the satellite, they're then tagging, you know, with the coordinates, automatically tagging it with the coordinates because we've got that information. Um, potentially, you know, what's being found underneath there so that that data is getting included in the metadata to go along with that photograph yeah and the key thing is that cloud in there is the primary um data primary system. storage yeah, it's coming straight into us and they're using the s3 api the s3 api s3 api was written or is uh, developed by amazon web services mm-hmm. but they kind of made it um available for anybody to use right i see um very very um powerful is something like 420 well it'd be more than that now i've always said 420 verbs it, it, it it'd be way above that now very clever in terms of what you can do with your data yeah it's so it, it's that um extra mile where you can integrate storage management control uh, data management and control actually into your application. So if yeah. you develop your own application, you can make S3 requests to query the data, you know, interrogate metadata and then bring all that out. So it's, I think we're only beginning to scratch the surface on the power of, of, of this. I mean, you know, AWS are phenomenally successful and, um, you know, they have some very smart stuff, but, um, you know, we're trying to bring that to the so our customers that want to have that in their own data center. That makes sense. So actually, we've gone in a couple of trends already. <laughs> so we've gone through like, well, obviously object storage and turn, well, it's Splunk's tagline, turn data into doing, but I think it sums it up pretty well. And then you've also talked about data gravity as well, where the, uh, no, is that what you meant by data gravity, where 
everything is going towards the primary store of data, including then, I guess, the applications, the applications on top. Yeah. So, so something on that one is, you know, let, let's go back, you know, I don't know, let's say 15 years ago when you had a, um, a file server, you'd have a file server in, um, you know, a remote branch office, you know, maybe there's a hundred people there, you know, that they, they would, they would want that, that local file storage. So there's good performance, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and go back, you know, 20 years ago, internet links weren't great. Well, you know, what was, um, you know, 100 people were maybe using, you know, 10 terabytes of storage. Then They're now wanting to access everything that everybody's got, um, you know, across the, the, the company. So what you'll find is the, you know, people need to build this big consolidated data platform where there's petabytes of data. And mm-hmm. if you like, they're going to be pulling, sucking in that um, file server towards the data. Because you're not going to put out petabytes into that branch office you know, just for those hundreds. Just imagine the traffic costs of that. Well, it's, 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 it's kind of not doable. It's not doable. So in a way, file system technology uh, or file, you know, file serving technology is very outdated. And especially where we are today with the pandemic that we're in, mm. you know, everyone's working at home now. File server technology is designed where it's on the network that you're on. You're all sitting on the same LAN. Um, it's not designed for sharing across the internet and security and, mm-hmm. you know, collaboration is, is become, um, you know, really key. So I think there's going to be a shift from using file servers to potentially using object storage on the back end. And then there's you know, a whole bunch of application solutions um, that provide file serving, but over the, designed over the internet. So more like Dropbox, think about Dropbox, yeah. how popular that was. You know, the solutions now that could have object storage at the back end. And like a Dropbox um, front end, so yeah. it's very easy to see what you've got and what you want to sh- share, what you don't want to share, you know, how to collaborate. And that's all, you know, within the control of your, your organizational IT. Dropbox would have been something that, you know, what was termed shadow IT, where hmm. you know, it's easy to use. I don't want to use the file server from corporate because it's complicated and difficult. And, you know, I'm not an IT person. I'm going to drop the stuff into Dropbox. I'm going to share that with my colleague, you know, in another office. That's that data immediately is outside of the control of, of corporate IT. It's a risk in terms of someone could hack it. It's not being backed up. You know, all, yeah. all these sort of type of concerns. But people like the ease of use of, yeah. of Dropbox, right? I mean, it, it, it was a real pioneer and. I think you know there's and our a lot teams of we get that get there nearly in yeah. Google Drive. The thing is, we've we've also got one of our other partners is Netscope, which helps with that security across all those disparate cloud things. And it's more about they're probably going to do it anyway because people work hard and they just want the job done. So having just the visibility of it is a really helpful kind of um, piece in that so netscope can give you visibility across all of that kind of sharing yeah i mean i mean, I mean especially it's, it's another challenge now where you're bringing your data out of the data center out, out outside of your from behind your firewall let's say yeah off um <laughs> that introduces a whole new world especially with regulations like gdpr um, mm. that, i mean that that was a bit of a, a game changer for us a couple of years ago in the storage in the storage world and for anybody dealing with data um yeah and and i think the other the other one at the moment is ransomware that's um yeah evil people have gone for it over this pandemic and have decided right we're going to take advantage of this urgency and then put people to ransom yeah yeah i mean garmin was just one recently mm-hmm. um you know the um, gps trackers i mean they got hit what was it just it was just a couple of weeks ago wasn't it that's right and, yeah and they and they have a lot of um personal information because you know, you're you're you know running and you're putting all your sort of vital statistics in and, and these things. Yes, I'm, I'm saying this thing. I've got no idea because I'm not a. Well, we don't uh, quote us. Those, uh, we know Garmin will ransomware. We don't know what happened and what they sold. Ah. <laughs> you never know. But you know, I was approached by um, a, a big investment bank just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they had a mandate from their board. Um, we need to have protection against ransomware mm-hmm. because most organisations right now, I'd say. 95% of organizations don't have protection against ransomware. Right. And it is it is actually scary when you think about it, and especially who, they, they don't care who they're going after, the, the hackers. Um, I mean, they've attacked NHS, Garmin, you know, um, 
I mean, I've got a, I've got a whole presentation where there's, you know, all the names, the big, big names um, mm. that you would think maybe would have had better security. But I mean, you can't say that because security can be compromised at all times. Yeah. Object storage, and, and we use, um, you know, Worm, right, once we read many technology object lock. Um, that is actually, a, a, it's a vaccination against ransomware because it basically locks your data and ransomware is all about encrypting, changing the data to a format you can't read it. Yeah. They'll only give it back to you if you pay them, and they'll give you a, the, the encryption key. Yeah. We actually lock down the data that you cannot change it. Oh. So it doesn't matter if somebody gets in and tries to encrypt it, you, they can't, they just can't change it. Now that's got the, you know, the connotations that actually as a user, as a company, you can't delete it either. Um, so you've got to be very careful about how long you uh, put the retention policy on for. Yeah. Because the only way you're getting rid of it is if you're going to take a sledgehammer to the... Um, Does that mean you have basically control. like a, a snapshot along the way? Uh, so, you know, if someone does try to steal your data or gets access, you can just roll back to like a few minutes ago. Is that is that what you mean? It, that it's no, every no, second? it's as soon as as soon as the um, ob so 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 object storage works slightly differently to regular storage. So if you make um, a change to um, you know a file, mm -hmm. it doesn't kind of change it in place, and that's where snapshot technology plays. Right, you take a snapshot of a file, let's say a word document, yeah, um, and then you do a snapshot an hour later. Now, you might have opened up that document about 10 times in that hour, and you, on the last point, just before the next snapshot, you might have done that save as, uh, not save as, mm -hmm. or, or you, and you just completely, you know, Messed deleted up. everything that you've yeah. just done. You could go back to an hour ago, right, and get yeah. your data back, because you are changing it in place. Yes. With object, every single one of those changes would have been saved as a new object. Oh, okay. automatically with not, um, you know, not with. So we have something called versioning, which is similar to snapshots. Every so you can keep multiple versions of an object. Right. So I see. Automatically, a new object is created when you make a change. It's up to you how many how many versions do I want to keep. Otherwise, you can run the risk of. Well, I've just got so your storage heavy. very very quickly. Yeah. Then yeah. what we what we can do is we say as the date is written that version is going to be locked. Mm -hmm. And typically what, what we're doing, actually we're focusing on locking up um, backup data. Yeah. So that, that, you know, we're not going to, you know, so what, and the hackers are getting increasingly more sophisticated than that they're targeting the backup data first. They'll, they'll encrypt that. And then once they've got access in the network, they'll start to go back and try and get access to their primary copy of the data. Yeah. Because as soon as, you're going to notice the primary copy being encrypted you yeah. know, quite quickly because mm -hmm. all of a sudden your data is not accessible. And then you can go back to your backup and you can recover and it and you've negated, that you've negated the threat. If they encrypt the backup first, yes. right. um, we've, got, we've got nowhere to go. So where we're targeting right now is lock up your backup. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've always got that um, you know, recourse. So this investment bank is from the board. You know, it's from the board. It's from... Yeah, you know non-IT people because ransomware was put in the top five um, global risks it, by the World um, Economic Forum. Not not IT, you know. So they have you know yeah. risks of you know nuclear war and um, <laughs> bizarrely the pan a, a pandemic wasn't was in the one. Top five. It wasn't. Oh, oh, I thought it would have been. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Hindsight's a great thing. <laughs> right, I, <laughs> I don't I, know if I would have. Had... I guess it's number one now, but um, yeah, yeah, but ransomware is in the top five. Well, yeah, all um, of the, all of it is around data now. But so, think about so... that data. I mean, you know, we had NHS attacks. So think of it: the height of the COVID pandemic. If you know, all of the health organisations suddenly were locked out of all of their data, I mean, things would have been a lot worse mm -hmm. That's than they right. were. So it's it's not just. Um, a pie in the sky kind of, oh, you know, this might happen, we might lose our data and have to recover. It's, you know, I mean, companies going down and, uh, you know, healthcare, it, it is risky. And if, yeah. Um, yeah, some of these people are, are after it for more than just money as well. Mm -hmm. Political motivations, mm -hmm. times aren't there. So. so we've got three big trends. We've got the object storage and turning, actually using our data. We've got that data gravity where um, the uh, you know, applications are coming towards that primary store. And then we've got ransomware, 
um, so protect it better. Cloudian's helping in all of these. What about um, what about all these containers and Docker and HashiCorp and that sort of thing? Because we're talking about storage, but from what I see is just it's all about little segments of, there's a big trend towards little segments of data, I guess, or just servers, and then they get ripped down again and then rebuilt. All of that transience, that's that's a big trend, right? Huge. Um, and I think that's where the, the, the you know, basically applications now, that's, that's how they're being developed. So I think there's, there's, there's a couple of pieces there. I mean, and in, in it's the advent of, you know, the rise of the public cloud or the, the, the mega, mega providers. I think Amazon, Google and Microsoft, you know, those three have really driven some of these. Um, and especially Amazon, I think they've been a trailblazer mm. in a number of areas. And of course, they've been so phenomenally successful that they're, you know, so many organizations use their technology. That, I mean, they have, you know, some amazing, amazing stuff. Um, and, 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 you know, and let's be honest, we are trying to follow in their footsteps a little bit, uh, mm-hmm. looking at what they're doing because they are purely cloud focused. Yeah. You know, they're saying if your data is in the cloud, you should be using our stuff. We're kind of saying, well, you know, it can get very expensive. Let's try and produce uh, an Amazon like experience that you can have in your own data center where if you have, you know, hundreds of petabytes of data, it doesn't make economic sense to have that in the cloud. No. And then, then think about, you know, all of a sudden, if you don't want to use Amazon anymore, you've got to get that back. Hmm. Well, how, how long is that going to take? And they charge you when you read data back, that's going to cost you a lot of money. So there's, there's a lot of good reasons why you would want to do this kind of stuff on premise. I think the reality is that people want to make use of both. They want the hybrid. Yeah. Um, you know, capability. So there's going to be stuff that they want to keep on on premise. They want stuff that's in the cloud and there's going to be stuff that they want to move between the two, especially if they want to do that bursting, um, you know, end of, end of, end of year sale or Mm -hmm. end of month batch processing where all of a sudden you need to quadruple your processing capability that, you know, that's, the nirvana that you can suddenly burst out, you know, stand up a whole lot of servers in the cloud, help you out on that thing. And then when you bring them down again, you know, you're not going to get charged. So the containerization is, is that in a, in, in a, in a microcosm that you're kind of looking at an application. And if you, you need, let's say you need 10 servers to run your application. That application is probably made up of a whole bunch of different services and doing different things at different times. Mm-hmm. Do you need to have 10 physical servers running? Can we have services that just stop and start as part of that sort of workflow? And that's where the, the containers come into play. The container is basically, it's like a little application that gets started, does its job and stops. Mm-hmm. And when it stops, especially in the in the, the public cloud space, then you're not getting charged for it. It, it is transient. You're only paying for it when you use it. Now, with all of these sort of workloads, and that's how people are now developing their apps. And mm-hmm. you still, even though these app, these um, you know the, the, the containers are transient, nothing is kept in that. Your data needs to be persistent at all times. So as people are sort of developing these applications in these sort of cloudy ecosystems, they're using things like S3 storage. An S3 API has kind of become the default for cloud storage, object storage, whatever you want to call it. And a lot of people are kind of, you know, using, you know, file, file data, object data, unstructured data, if you like, like, like what Splunk are, are doing. Um, so anything they can do to reduce the cost of running in the cloud, that's how they're developing their apps. Now, you know, as they then bring them and run them in on premise, do they have the platform to do that? Maybe, maybe not. It depends if they've got S3 storage. So, you know, we're, we're actually partnering with uh, VMware and VMware is, you know, they want to be the cloud um, operating system. They want to have a layer that bridges, you know, um, on-premise and off-premise um, mm-hmm. platforms so they can give you that experience of, you've got this application running, you need another 20 CPUs behind that because it's end of year. Mm-hmm. They can do that. They can bring them in. So they're now just bringing out their um, container platform. You know, VMware was always around virtual machines. That's, yeah. you know, what they've done forever. They see that, you know, the containers, that's, you know, huge now and it's just going to get bigger. So they need to introduce 
um, the containerization. They're bringing in Kubernetes, you know, into their into their kind of vSphere uh, layer. Now they also need S3 storage, so we're working with them. We already have a, a solution with VMware for the service providers, but um, we're going to be the persistent S3 storage, Excellent. or what? One of the will be the first one in the VMware layer. You know, I don't think it's an exclusive um, relationship. They can see other people if they want to. <laughs> um, but you know, we, we, we've been working with them for over a couple of years now, and and you know, we've got a good synergy. Um, and I think being able, for VMware to be able to offer, they've always wanted to have that stack compute network storage. They do storage with vSAN, which is their kind of primary. We're kind of giving them that final missing piece, yeah. which is the unstructured data storage, object storage, archive storage, whatever you want to call it. Oh, but that is primary storage for your um, containerized services. So it's just it's just bringing in that ability to allow people to develop their containerized um, applications, whether it's on prem, off prem, or, or hybrid, right, or doing something. So we can give that nice consistent storage, persistent storage. You know, move that data between cloud and, and on premise as well. So yeah, yeah, and and you, and you yeah, I mean. You know, you know, we talked when we talked earlier. I can just talk for everyone. On no, all, no, I don't, don't, so don't say that. To, you're gonna have to I, tell I, me okay, so no, I've got the four trends now. <laughs> you did say three before, but four is fine. I'm happy with four because the third one is ransomware, which is huge. So we got object storage, we've got data gravity, we've got ransomware, and we've got containerization. All clouding is all over all of the four. Um, what I promised was an example. Um, <laughs> And I promised it first, but let's do it now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So because basically I want people to understand how people will use Cloudian. Because from my perspective, as you said, um, when you use Cloudian with Splunk, you basically put it in as the smart store. So it it is like a bolt-on. That's how we use it for a lot of clients, which yeah. can make it cheaper. Yeah. Um, so when there's different buckets, there's cold, uh, warm, and hot the cold the the cold and warm buckets get sort of shifted across to cloudian but can still be searched so it's yeah. just a more efficient way to 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 you to where to put your data um so i've i've seen a lot of that kind of use case where it's make it cheaper but you you mentioned that you've got an example which has has splunk in that way but also mm -hmm. moves on to cloudian so why don't you just tell us about that one Sure. So this this is, um, um, and I'm not going to mention any names. I mean, this no. is a um, you know financial hedge fund in the city of London. Mm -hmm. um, initially, we engaged with those guys for a backup platform. I think it was. I think they were using Rubric. Um, Rubric is a is a backup platform. Um, so they needed some archive storage for their Rubric backup, and you know, it was a reasonable size. I think it was a couple of um, petabytes and. Mm -hmm. You know, they had uh, the cluster distributed across a couple of data centers, so they had off-site recovery. Then um, the second use case that they had was for, for Splunk. And where, where we work, what the value we bring into a Splunk environment is that essentially when Splunk started, they, they went down what I would describe as a, a hyper-converged route. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Splunk is an analytic, analytics engine that, you know, gathers lots of um, log files from, you know, various sources and they, you know, search for certain data and you, put, you build your dashboards so you can see when events are happening. When you're first initially bringing that data in and you're doing your indexing and finding your data, you need fast storage. You need the sort of the, you know, 15K spinning drives. I mean, I don't, whether anybody buys them anymore, I think it's predominantly flash now. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's, there's flash storage carries a quite a high price tag. And, of course, your size is Splunk environment um, because you need CPU, you know, you need this, mm -hmm. this IOPS. And most people use sort of normal sort of x86 servers. They've got a bit of storage, a bit of this, a bit of that. And then the hyperconverged model is that when you need more storage or more CPU, you add another server into that cluster. Yeah. So at some point, you're adding in more service purely because you want the storage, not necessarily the CPU. You know, you've mm -hmm. collected more data and that data is now just growing, but you're not processing any more yep. than you were, you know, let's say, um, you know, six months previously. Yep. So the CPU is there, but you're putting in more nodes now just for the storage. And those nodes are going to be expensive because you're using expensive 
story. So, you know, I, I talked to a, <laughs> it was a big financial, let's just call them in, in the credit card world. Um, we spoke to them last year. They had a three and a half thousand node um, Splunk cluster. And they've been, nodes. they they reckoned that they'd put in about 1500 servers in that cluster just for storage. So what we what we kind of are proposing is all of that data that you don't need on fast storage through the cold or even warm buckets, yeah. move that down into our storage platform, which is a lot more cost effective. Mm-hmm. And then you know you can actually, if you've got a you know with this example in the US, you know they could actually take out three and a half, you know, maybe two thousand servers, um, you know, and just have it as a cost saving there. But for organisations now, it's it's an alternative to as we are growing, should we put in another server or should we put that data down into, you know, a, a more appropriate storage platform? Right. So I think Splunk have just sort of realized that the cost of the infrastructure that their customers are having to deploy, to, you know, to get to where they want to be, it, it's, a, it's a barrier to sale for them. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've had a number of conversations with a bunch of people at Splunk and, you know, when you've got to buy three and a half thousand servers to run your analytics engine, that's, that's expensive. So that's exactly what this um, customer in the UK, so obviously they've gone with backup to start with as one use case. Then they wanted to, they could see that they were going to generate an awful lot of data in Splunk. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they were, they were, they made the, I think they're at the right point where then they made a decision, let's start to put some of that data onto the object store. And I mean, that's expected to be a couple of petabytes very, very quickly, probably by the end of the year. And then they actually then had a third use case, which was, for a very high performance to do with trading and you know um, tick data that needs to be processed very quickly because when you're in that space, a matter of seconds might make you a lot of money. You know, it's yeah, about yeah. it's about um, you know buying, selling stuff just at the right time. So they actually are working with a, a vendor called Wecker IO who provide this very very you know, blazingly fast file system, <clears throat> all all flash storage, you know, all kind of optimized. But of course, again, that data is going to get cold and you mm-hmm. don't want to sit on that expensive storage. So again, it's just about tiering data, making sure it's in the right place. Yeah. So then they will, the Wecker IO will, you know, when that as that data ages out and it's not being accessed, it will then just move to Cloudium, just using S3. So all so we've got three applications there, Splunk, Wecker, and, um, and Rubrik, and they all talk S3. And then we just sit underneath and we provide a bucket, as, as the terminology, um, to each application and just say, right, you know, fill I your boot, throw it down, and then we will take care of it. We will distribute it across multiple nodes. We'll protect it how you want it to protect. You know, we'll send it across multiple data centers. And, and in a way, the customer just has to kind of forget about it. Yeah, that's great. And then it's intelligent as well, so it has all of the tags that you might have wanted on it. Yeah, yeah. So, and that, and that's that, and that's the key thing. And I think more as as people learn how to use the power of the S3 API and, and metadata tagging, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to be investing in that a lot more to to use that. It brings so much value. Maybe not to the rubric data, or maybe not to the Splunk data, um, because that is. Already, it's almost like we're just getting like this this file that's got a load of stuff dumped into it. You know, there's there's no value for us to to do that. Rubric and Splunk are going to bring the value to that. Yeah. But if you're using it as this primary archive where you're putting the data directly into that and you're controlling, I want to tag this. That's the stuff that at the moment gets completely forgotten about. SharePoint is is kind of think about SharePoint and about what you used to do with that. Yeah. That's the Quite a close analogy to object storage. But obviously, the object storage stuff is hidden in the background. You know, yeah. SharePoint, you always had to use another storage platform and it was like a portal yes. to your data and you could, you know, tag and stuff. So think about, you know, it's like a modern day. Ship. <laughs> so I want that tagline. No, 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 let's not do that. that. No, no, let's not end with that one. <laughs> the machine learning on top would be fabulous. Could you do that, please, Neil? To, to automate yeah. that stuff? Yeah, so the the machine, I mean, the machine learning. When you're training um, an AI or machine learning, it, it is it is human intensive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we you know um, we we didn't actually win the business. In fact, I don't know if it actually happened, but there was a an opportunity for a big airport expansion. 
Mm, I don't know who that might be. Mm. Um, they were looking at a field and there was some concern about the, the, the birds that were in that field and, um, yeah. you know, whether they were taken away, whether they were rare and taken away nesting. And then we were talking about uh, an automatic image recognition of all the different birds to yeah. see what they were. And, you know, you you have to have, you have to train it to say you know what a sparrow looks like. You yeah. know what, um, you know, a chaffinch looks like. Uh, I'm running out of bird names already. Crows. And, <laughs> r- r- I mean, rubbish data in, rubbish data rubbish out. Data so you've got exactly, to train yeah. the machine before. So you need somebody yeah. to, I mean, you, you probably for six months you need somebody looking at all of the, the, the photographs that you take just to kind of see what they are. And you want pictures from different angles. So what yeah. does a sparrow look like from the back? the side the front Fly, the oh God, and, yeah and yeah and you need an, a bird expert to be able to identify from these pictures you know, so almost are. it's not worth doing yet well one day soon when the learning is quicker <laughs> but let's let's just focus on the actual trends that you see now rather than me throwing in a random one there um thank you so much for going through it's very interesting to hear from the context that you have of of, of seeing these data storage trends across time and that exponential growth you see going forward. Um, I'll summarize finally, like the object storage, the data gravity. I love that term, by the way. I'm going to use it all the time, data gravity. My husband's going to be annoyed with me. Ransomware three and containerization. And I just, um, I'm looking forward to seeing far more use cases then with with you guys um, from, from our perspective as well. Yeah. Um, mostly it's our clients who listen to this. Mostly they have Splunk. So it would be, it, it hearing about that hedge fund and how they're using it um it's quite useful thank you yes no problem um yeah i mean just and, and if um you know any, anybody wanted to dive into any other area or go a bit deep more you know more detail on any of these things then um you know if they, if they reach out just let me know and we can yeah, absolutely. Can they look for you on uh, LinkedIn? Would that I'm, be I'm cool? on LinkedIn, yeah. LinkedIn is about the only thing I do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like social media usually, but Neil Stover on LinkedIn. And you can reach out to me too if you have any questions. What we'll do and on this podcast page that we have, you can we'll put like a link at the bottom so that you know who to reach. And there's marketing at summerfordassociates.com because um, that's what this podcast is for basically because Summerford, we're just here to help, trying to point you to the right um, vendor, see what help you in your pain points. So yeah, just reach out.